Hello, today is Friday, March 6, 2015, and I'm your host, Sue Brown, and welcome to Info to Rail, your freight train to modern media. How y'all doing today? Welcome to our show, and we have a great store for you, show for you in store today. We're very fortunate to have parapsychologist, director of the Office of the Paranormal Investigations, and president of the Forever Family Foundation, Lloyd Auerbach, with us today. Um, first, we're going to take a little glimpse into the paranormal news. According to etoneline.com, Long Island Medium's Teresa Caputo tests her paranormal expertise with E.T.'s pop quiz. E.T.'s Jason Dun Dundas got to witness Long Island Medium Teresa Caputo in her element before the show season premiere, putting her to the test with a paranormal pop quiz. While having lunch with Teresa at Nino's Tuscany Steakhouse in Manhattan, the psychic medium got a vibe from the other side of the room where several women were eating in the corner. Your husband wants you to know he's not restricted anymore, Teresa told the woman. He's trying to let you know and thank you for the way you cared for him. Do you understand? The message was clear as the woman's husband never thanked anyone while he was alive. Now it's coming through, to, through me to you. She said Jason was blown away by how Teresa had touched the woman's heart. That is fascinating. I'll tell you, psychics in, in these, you know, the, the way that they connect is, is absolutely amazing. Well, our guest today is Lloyd Arbach, MS Parapsychology, Director of the Office of Paranormal Investigations and President of the Forever Family Foundation. He's been in the field for over 35 years, focusing on education and field investigation. He's the author of nine books, including The Ghost Detective's Guide to Haunted San Francisco, co-authored with the late renowned psychic Annette Martin. His newest release is ESP Wars East and West, covering the psychic spy program of the U.S. and Soviet Union Russia. It was co-authored with Dr. Edwin C. May, who ran the U.S. program, and Dr. Victor Rubel. The book is now available on Amazon.com and other online booksellers. He is a professor at Atlantic University and JFK University and teaches parapsychology local and distance through H. HCH Institute in Lafayette, California, and online courses through the Rhine Education Center. He is on the board of the Rhine Education Center and the advisory boards of the Windbridge Institute and the Forever Family Foundation. His media appearances on TV, radio, and print and in print number in the thousands, including ESPN Sports Center, ABC's The View, Oprah and Larry King Live. He works as a parapsychologist, a professional mentalist, psychic entertainer, public speaker, and media skill coach, and a profess professional chocolatier. What a fascinating guest we got coming up for you guys, and I can't wait to get to it. This is going to be amazing. We're going to take a short break right now, and when we return, we will have Lloyd Arbach with us. Stay tuned. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Well, we're back here with Lloyd Arbach. Um, we'd like to welcome you to Info to Rail, and we'd really like to thank you for joining us today. Sure, my pleasure. Um, I'm really excited about this interview. I've been into the paranormal for, for a lot of years myself, um, so this is very exciting, and I know our listeners are excited too. Um, can you start out by telling us, telling our listeners, um, how you got interested and involved in the in parapsychology and the paranormal? Well, I've been interested in psychic phenomena since I was probably, I don't know, four or five years old. Um, I credit a lot of it to having a television set in my room when I was two. My dad worked for NBC, so I actually I was an, I'm an early TV child. And I watched TV shows like Topper and uh, even One Step Beyond the Twilight Zone, even when I was very, very little. But I also read comic books. Um, so it was kind of the superhero powers that got me somewhat interested in all of this um, and the ghost stories I saw on TV. And then as I grew up, I uh, it was really science fiction and comic books that kept my interest in and a real strong interest in science sent me to the library to look for books on parapsychology and I was able to find them, fortunately. That is awesome. 
Um, I myself was the same way when I was a kid. Um, the difference is I had par paranormal visit me, so that's how I started it all off. Ah. Um, can you explain to our listeners what is parapsychology? Parapsychology is the study of psychic phenomena, which uh, are experiences and occurrences and phenomena that seem to connect to human consciousness. Um, we deal with extrasensory perception. We deal with psychokinesis or mind over matter, and we deal with an area called survival of bodily death, the idea that human consciousness or mind or spirit, whatever you want to call it, can survive the death of the body. And we deal with all the phenomena around that. So the things that people uh, call paranormal that have to do with psychic experiences, which include ghosts and hauntings, are what we study. All right. Is there a difference between ghosts and spirits? It depends on who you talk to. You know, the word ghost has a lot of cultural contexts around the world. And in, in fact, in parapsychology, we tend to use the term apparition or even the term discarnate entity um, to refer to people who are hanging around after they've died, simply because ghost does have so many different connotations to it. But if you talk to, for example, spirit mediums around the world, they generally would consider a ghost to be someone who has not moved to the other side yet, someone who is still present with us, versus a spirit who is someone who is on the other side and communicating back. Um, how, do, how would a spirit communicate with us um, if it has passed? How would it communicate with us? Um, so basically it has a way of, of leaving the other side per se? To be able to well, speak with us, you know, this again, we're getting, we're going back to working with spirit mediums. Um, I work with a number of mediums. I'm, I'm president of an organization called the Forever Family Foundation, which supports the work of spirit mediums and family grieving, but also supports research into scientific research on life after death and especially around mediumistic communication. And the idea, it seems, is that people on the other side are either just simply kind of dialing in, you might say, right. the medium the medium is actually kind of like an operator, is, is the intermediary, and they are connecting telepathically, because that's what that's how all ghosts communicate, is through mind-to-mind -mind communication, whether they're here as ghosts or whether they're on the other side as spirits. Uh, some mediums do believe that they can project themselves from that other world or dimension to our world, uh, but only, you know, typically, they're doing it in such a way that it has to be in certain settings and certain types of people are capable of doing it. So not everyone can necessarily connect with spirits on the other side, but a lot more people can certainly see ghosts or experience them here. Um, why is it you think that um, these ghosts that haven't crossed, why is it you think they haven't crossed? What do you think it is that keeps them here? Well, if you look at the literature and people's ex reported experiences, as well as the communications both witnesses and psychics and mediums have had uh, for the 130 plus years of our history in parapsychology and psychical research, there is a lot of reasons. Sometimes it is the classic reason that the person has unfinished business, although usually the unfinished business is they, they wanted to make sure their, their family is okay without them. So it's very different than what we see in movies. Sometimes they are just in plain denial that they're dead or they don't want to admit that they're dead or they may not even, you know, they may be kind of so traumatized by what happened to them that they feel like they they haven't, they're not dead. Sometimes they are just so connected to their life that they don't want to leave. And then we get a lot of reports from, from people. Um, it seems that sometimes they are afraid to move on. I mean, you know, you if you grew up in a religion or in an area, a society or culture that believes that you may be damned after death, then you may not be in a hurry to go someplace if you right? didn't think your, your life was perfect. Um, so the, it's it's all of those things. We even have sometimes uh, people who know that they're dead and they want to move on, but they, they haven't seen the light. They were told throughout their entire life that you have to look for the light. And they're kind of, uh, what, what we do know is that in general, people are kind of keeping themselves here. Um, but that's, it also can be that some ghosts are being kept here by their family. Uh, you know, somebody doesn't want to let them go. So they're not grieving properly. They, they can't recognize that. And the person who is the ghost just feels like they have to stay until that person actually lets them go. Wow. That is, that's fascinating. Um, what, what is a poltergeist? Is that, is that any different? Is that different from a ghost or a spirit? Very different. Uh, even though the term literally translated from German means noisy ghost. 
Uh, that term was was coined probably at least as far back as the, the 16th century in Germany, and it refers to cases or situations in which there's physical object movement or physical effects. Today, we actually have a lot of electronic effects that happen in poltergeist cases, but usually things moving around. With the most rare exceptions, there are no ghosts even sensed or felt or seen or heard, but there are physical things. So you have objects moving, you might have wraps in the walls, um, you could even have little fire effects and water effects that sometimes happen or light effects. And th the idea of them being purely physical is really important because in most apparition or ghost cases, people the, if you had 10 people in the room, maybe half of them might see the ghost or not even half. Only a couple people might see the ghost and other people might experience the ghost differently. In poltergeist cases, if something moves, it's something moving. It's real. And we have over the last century, especially since the late 50s, uh, had a model that has played out and has been tested in field investigation, field work around a living person's unconscious mind actually moving the objects through psychokinesis, mind over matter. Wow. Um, why is it some of us can see spirits and ghosts and some of us can't? Why is it some of us can paint well and some of us can't? Right. I mean, um, well, my guess my question is, do we all have the ability to actually see them and we're just no. not channeling it? No, it's, you know, we all have some psychic, it seems like we all have some psychic aptitude or some psychic talent. It's kind of like musical, it's almost like any creative talent for that matter, like musical ability or artistic ability. We have different applications of it. There are people who can paint really well, but they could not sculpt to save their lives. There are people who are great at percussion instruments, but they can't play a stringed instrument. They don't have an aptitude for learning the stringed instrument for whatever reason. So it seems that, you know, there is this thing called psychic ability, which includes being able to, to communicate or see spirits. And that's on a continuum. And some people have different aptitudes for bringing out those talents. Uh, you kind of have to figure out what you're good at. Uh, I, I've known, for example, a couple of psychics who were extremely good at working with police in that they could be on the scene or hold an object and be able to describe the crime and the, even the suspect. But if you bring them into a case with an actual apparition, they, they don't have any experience. They're kind of worthless at that point. So you have people who can read living people but don't see the dead. It's just a matter of what we're good at. And it may be that there's a genetic component. Uh, it seems that this is hereditary in some respects. And there is a geneticist here on the West Coast who is going to start doing some test uh, some looks at the DNA of some of the remote viewers from the U.S. government remote viewing program to see if there is something common, which he suspects there is actually genetically in their ability. Can you explain uh, to our listeners what EVP is? Yeah, um, EVP stands for electronic voice phenomena. And the strict definition is that it's voices created in an electronic device. It's not an acoustical sound that was recorded. It is uh, you have a recording device or even just recording media. There are a few cases on record of just an unopened cassette. Um, when people have asked for the spirit to actually put something or a ghost to put something on the cassette, they start playing back the cassette and then there's voices there. So it's the idea is that there are voices, inexplicable voices that seem to have been created in the device or on the recording media itself. And we assume that it's been done by discarnate entities, by spirits or ghosts. But it also could have been done by the living people themselves, uh, since we have evidence that living people can affect such devices also. Um, and also, can you explain remote viewing to our listeners? Sure. Uh, that's a term referring to a specific application of clairvoyance, which is you know, a form of ESP where you – real-time ESP, where you kind of – know what's in an envelope or know what's what's hidden from you uh, outside the range of your normal senses. Remote viewing, the idea is that a person is looking remotely or perceiving remotely, because it's not only always visual, there's other things people can pick up. And they might be um, focusing on a distant location, you know, 100 feet away or 5,000 miles away. Uh, the U.S. government Stargate program, uh, which ran from 1972 to 1995, it's actually the subject of uh, my latest book, which was co-written by, by the head of that program, Ed May. Uh, the book's called ESP Wars. And what happened in that program is that, that they found people in the Army and, and around the armed services who were capable of learning to do or practicing and doing remote viewing. And many of the targets were 
locations in the Soviet Union and in other parts of the world. And the Russians actually had a similar program going as well. Huh. Well, all of this hits home for me. Um, I just lost my dad in October. Um, he was diagnosed with cancer in February and I lost him in October. Um, he's in my dreams often and it's crazy. Um, it's, it's not just once in a blue moon, it's, it's often. And in my dreams, he's alive, he's safe, he's walking, he's talking. He tells me he's totally fine, he's not sick anymore, that I need to stop worrying about him. Hmm. Um, is, do you feel that they, that our loved ones, when we dream about them, do you feel that, that, that that's indeed them reaching out to us and really communicating with us? It sure can be. I mean, it's not always that. Uh, but it certainly can be that you know the, when you're grieving, of course you you still haven't let the person go. So that that it could be your own unconscious bringing that person in. But there are I wrote a book on psychic dreams many years ago and did a lot of research in this area. I talked to a lot of folks, and there are instances certainly um, where it's it does seem that it's absolutely spirit communication or communication with that person in the dream state. And, you know, if your father in your dream, for example, is telling you that he's fine and to let him go, just assume that that's really him and that's what you need to do. Um, it's kind of telling you to kind of move on with your life at that point. Well, I mean, my mom and my family and myself, we're all at peace with it. Uh, yeah. the, the end was, you know, it was just a rough ending. And yeah. to see him go was actually a blessing. In, I, to watch him suffer one more moment was it just destroyed us. So to let him go was very peaceful. And we've been really at peace with the whole thing. I just wondered because, you know, just out of nowhere, he'll show up and I'll say, why are you walking around the house? You're you're not here anymore. And he'll say, right. looks like I'm here to me, you know, with his smart aleck way he was. But and that, is that in your dreams only or are you experiencing that otherwise? Um, I'm not experiencing that with him. I did experience that with my grandfather. Um, he died in 1990, and I, I didn't realize that people that close to you died. And that was my first big experience with that closeness. And my grandfather was sitting on the edge of my bed, and I was quite wide awake. And he said to me, you need to let me go where I am. There's no such thing as pain, and I'm fine. And you need to take care of your mom and your family and just let this go. That's, you know, that's actually, that type of experience is probably the most common type of ghost experience. You know, when people ask me um, about the experiences people have, I, I think in our field, we figured it's something like 99% or more of the sightings or experiences with people who have died happen with family members, loved ones, rel you know, just people, friend, good friends. And they happen relatively soon, either at the moment of death or within a few days of that. And then the person just kind of moves on. It seems it's very few that stick around for much longer than that. But that kind of experience is typical. I mean, it's a very human experience and it, it really does suggest that th there's a connection between you and your grandfather, for example, there was a connection and he wanted yeah. to make sure you were OK. You know, a lot of the mediums tell us that it's not that they're here not because of them. They're here because of us. Right. Well, I was not OK because I didn't know how to handle even any of this i just yeah it was instant he just he was fine one minute and the thing is i was home sleeping on my couch and all of a sudden i was up there and i watched him pass i watched the his whole morning from sleeping mm. at my house three doors down all of a sudden i was in his living room and i watched him fall dead in his chair and it, i mean i could tell you in detail how he died and what happened every step of his morning because i was there even though I wasn't. Well, that indicates that you're, you know, that you definitely seem to have a psychic aptitude. That's almost like an out-of-body experience that may have been precipitated by your awareness that he was about to pass. I've had psychic abilities most of my life. Yeah. And a lot of them are through deja vu. I don't know why. If something bad's going to happen and it's, you know, it starts a deja vu moment, I know I have to change it immediately or I know the outcome is going to be bad. Well, that kind of precognition is really good. Um, you know, that's what we think precognition is for a lot of the times is to allow us to make changes on the on the fly. Um, the stuff we see on TV with the ghost crews and stuff like yeah. that, is, is that really how it works? Not from any sort of scientific perspective. That methodology was um, conjured up quite a bit by the TV production people themselves. 
Uh, you know, the whole idea of sitting around in the dark, that is, uh, especially with infrared cameras and night shot stuff, that is purely for television. And unfortunately, it's become the modus operandi of so many ghost hunting groups because they've all been watching those shows and mimicking what they see on TV. Uh, we find that ghosts don't normally appear in the middle of the night in the dark. What they do is they appear when people are typically awake uh, or the lights are on. Um, it can be the middle of the night, but usually the light, you know, there's it's not pitch black when that's happening, but it's pretty rare that the, these things are happening after dark. And one of the biggest problems I see with these shows is that they completely ignore when the ghosts are being seen. So, for example, they'll do a lights out or an overnight thing, even though the story of the location and the witnesses have all said, well, it happens at 11 o'clock in the morning. And they completely ignore the 11 o'clock in the morning time, which is the time that everybody else has had the experience. <laughs> right. <laughs> because it's spookier in the dark. And so as, if you take it as an ent entertainment show, that, that you have to look at it that way. Um, and then there's all sorts of issues on how they misuse the equipment and even, I guess you could say, falsely edit the shows. Although that's not, the editing's not the fault of the, the talent. That's the fault of the production people. Right. I heard you on interviews discuss the blue lady. Yeah. Will you share that story with us? Sure. Uh, there's a restaurant south of San Francisco uh, called the Moss Beach Distillery. It's it's had other names uh, in its origin in its early past, uh, early history. It was a uh, built as a residence in 1926 and then turned into a speakeasy uh, in 1927 by a local restaurateur named Frank Torres. And it was, it's above a beach, which was one of the places, a cove where they brought booze down from Canada f during Prohibition. Uh, it was a, instead of being a secret speakeasy, it was one of those places that politicians used to go to, the local chiefs of police. Uh, it was pretty protected, never was raided. It's, the, the restaurant itself was never raided. And somewhere around 1930, and we actually do not have records, even the local historian hasn't been able to find actual records before 1940 in the area of just about anything for that matter, because prohibition was going on at that time. There was a young woman who had come to work in the hotel, which at the time was next, there was a hotel next to the restaurant. And she was having, uh, she was seeing, um, having an affair with the piano player at the place, a guy named Charlie. And her apparently was was married and left her husband and one night the husband showed up this is the story we have from the locals one night the husband showed up and was thrown out because he caused the scene and later that night the woman and her boyfriend charlie were on the beach below and charlie was apparently knocked unconscious uh, and she had been found stabbed the next morning uh, stabbed in the back so we assumed it was the husband who did it and shortly after that people started seeing this woman uh, on the beach and then on the bluff near the beach and then eventually in the restaurant, even in the hotel until the hotel burned down in 1950, in the 50s. Uh, so she had been seen for quite some time. She was known, became known as the Blue Lady uh, because she always wore blue clothing. In fact, she always wore blue clothing before she died. She was known as the Blue Lady before she died, not just after she was a ghost. And the uh, in the 1970s, the couple that owned the place, the Andersons, had a shift in what happened. The, the activity shifted from people seeing her frequently to things moving around in a very, typically in a very helpful way, in fact, according to Pat Anderson, the woman who, who owned and lived in the place at the time. And in, the, uh, in around 1990, John Barber bought the place, who was a bit of a skeptic. Uh, he knew the place was haunted, but he, you know, he bought the place. He, he didn't care if there was a ghost story or not. Uh, I got involved in 91, was able to, to start working with the place uh, frequently, in fact, originally because of a Japanese television program that we set up there. But I've worked with multiple psychics, worked with many, many dozens of witnesses over the years. And essentially the blue lady who we come to know now as Kate, she doesn't appear as often as she did, but she was appearing even in the 1990s frequently to certain people. Uh, there were a couple of neighbors, residents of Moss Beach who would come over and have communications with her. Uh, people would see things moving, and we actually had a number of things moving even on our first visit to the place. And she's kind of a fun-loving, a uh, bit of a party girl kind of person. Uh, in the 20-some-odd year, almost 25-year history I've been working with the restaurant, we've had probably 10 different psychics and mediums in there, and I'm try always trying to bring in others to communicate with her. She has continued to appear to certain people who 
come to the restaurant, and certainly to people who work at the restaurant. Uh, but for the most part, it's still been some physical activity that's happened. Um, some of the activity included things were kind of silly when it came right down to it. Some workmen who were fixing things in the kitchen would re- report being whacked on the rear end by a spatula when no <laughs> one else was in the ro- in the kitchen. And uh, some of the male wait staff uh, and anybody and some maintenance people after hours would hear wolf, wolf whistles <laughs> wow. and then a woman's voice calling their name. <laughs> and, and in that time that I've worked there, um, I have actually had my own kind of encounters with her. I haven't seen her with my eyes, but I've felt her pass through me multiple times. And that was actually witnessed by three different psychics, which was kind of fun. So she's, she's uh, kind of an interesting character. And there's a good write-up of it. Uh, in my in our the book the ghost detective's guide to haunted san francisco which i co-authored with annette martin who passed away a couple of years ago she was a psychic and medium and she spent a lot of time with me at the distillery she became best buddies with the ghost and in fact according to some psychics and mediums she and kate are hanging out together so it's been kind of fun for us kate also has proven that ghosts are not limited to one location she's actually appeared at other locations and been seen by people in other places. Oh, wow. Um, what was your scariest experience in the paranormal? Um, I will tell you first that I've never been afraid or scared by psychic or paranormal phenomena. Never. But I've had two close encounters with guys with guns who, uh, were jealous husbands because the wives called me in. This is my early days when I used to go or stupidly went alone to some situations. And I was called in in a couple of cases. And in both instances, the husbands were not told that somebody was going to be there. Um, and they were both drunk <laughs> and guns came out. So that was probably the scariest things that ever happened to me. Wow. Um, you know, it's not it's not the dead you have to worry about. It's the living you have to worry about. Very true. <laughs> Um, a lot of people have different mixed uh, beliefs in reincarnation. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people think once you get up there in heaven with God, there's no way you can be reincarnated. Um, how do do you believe in reincarnation? Well, you know, uh, from the evidence, it certainly appears that some people are reincarnated, uh, and more than a, you know, more than a billion people on the planet believe in reincarnation in some form. And in fact, early, the early Christians. Um, the very the Gnostic Christians believed in reincarnation also uh, before the Council of Nicaea when it was kind of removed from the from the text, the various texts that have been there. So it's it is a belief um, of many, many people. We have in our field um, cases involving ch- young children, and these are specifically the best uh, the cases we choose to investigate. And it's uh, a lot of folks at the University of Virginia. Jim Tucker is kind of the main guy there nowadays. Used to be Ian Stevenson. Uh, Erlander Haraldson is a good friend of mine who's at the University of Iceland, also does a lot of this. And these are kids between typically three and five years old who spontaneously start talking about a past life. And they often, you know, talk in very great detail. And in some cases, they have enough detail where they're giving names and dates and places and addresses and that can be actually verified. So there's definitely something going on for some people. Um, whether everybody gets reincarnated, you know, when we, we've talked to the spirit mediums who talk to the spirits on the other side about this, apparently some people get reincarnated and some people and a lot of people choose to do other things. So it, there's a choice thing that may happen. Uh, there is, and there may be a divine plan for some of them, but it, it seems that only some people might get reincarnated. We do not typically give a lot of stock to past life regression as evidence for reincarnation, but it's one of the best therapeutic tools that people can use. So from a psychological perspective, it's great. From, a, from a, an evidential perspective, it's usually not very good. Well, I can relate to that. I have a seven-year-old daughter who when she was a little bit younger, three and four years old, she would tell me mm-hmm. about when she was 14 years old that she had this puppy and the puppy's name was this. And she would tell me where she lived. When she was 16, she did this. And I'm like, you're four years old. How did you do all this when you were 14? Yeah. You know, there may be, it's possible that there may be a lot more cases, you know, a higher percentage than we think there are. Um, and that's uh, the problem we have is what we would call a reporting artifact. You know, if, if, if it, your daughter is telling you this, the question is, are you going to call the University of Virginia and say, I've got a daughter who's remembering a past life? So, right. you know, we, we don't know 
how many people actually have kids that for for a time talk like this because what happens is for the majority like the vast majority of these cases these kids forget or the those memories fade at around age six or seven yep that's true she she doesn't remember the details she'll say yeah she'll yeah. say so, i don't remember mom so if a three-year-old starts talking yep <laughs> You know, parents, most parents, especially in the West, are going to immediately say, yeah, yeah, that's really kind of cool. That's great. Go off and play now. <laughs> no, I took her seriously. She was in some severe detail about just, I mean. That's good. She, she doesn't even know the places on the map at three and four years old, but she was telling me where she lived. <laughs> yeah, we would love, you know, I mean, really, um, Jim Tucker is kind of the advocate for, for parents, at least gathering that information. We would love in our field, um, many of us, for for our culture to be such that people could report that without fear of being seen weird or their kids being bullied or something like that. But that's the other issue is, you know, you have to make sure that um, because this is considered strange still in, in many parts, especially in certain religions in many parts of the country, it can be a real problem for even for the kids later on. There is absolutely nothing weird about my life. This stuff that goes on in my life with myself and my kids it, for us, paranormal and all that stuff is normal. <laughs> well, that's good. You know, if you really, if you really consider this, if you look at the number of experiences and just the range of experiences people have, and the number of people that actually have them, because we get you know emails and letters, and like I said, there's 130 years of this stuff uh, all around the world. Uh, the research has been gathering this. There's so much that this is actually not paranormal at all. It's actually it is normal. It may be unexplained. But it's still a very, very normal part of human experience. And most of us would really love for this to be considered not you know, a normal experience and, and not paranormal at all. Um, can you explain to us how telepathy works? I mean, how can we transmit information from one person to another without using any of our senses? Well, the explaining how, there are different theories and models that have developed around ESP. And um, there's even some talk about precognition being uh, fit from a physics perspective being the main form of ESP, even mimicking telepathy in some instances. Uh, but the idea of telepathy may be related to a qu the quantum functioning we call quantum entanglement of particles being kind of transmitting information from point A to point B, if those particles had ever been together at any point in their past. Uh, telepathy does tend to work more with people who have a, a connection, uh, emotional connection or some other kind of related that they actually know each other. It's pretty rare with strangers, although that can happen once in a while. And the mechanism, we know that it's not brain waves. We know that it's not electromagnetic waves. We know that we, we've already eliminated all the, the normal things, uh, or I would say the normal way we think of transmitting information. And in fact, the original model and even our experiments are based on senders and receivers. We talk about somebody looking at a picture and sending that to someone who is a receiver. That comes because when they started looking at telepathy, that's when radio first started happening. So it's almost like looking at mental radio. That was the original concept, but that's been very clearly um, shown that that's not what's happening. So we don't know if there's a quantum effect. Uh, it's If there is a quantum effect, the problem then we have is how does it get from that level of reality in our brains to our full awareness? Right. So there's still some some unanswered questions. There's a lot of unanswered questions about this because we're working with consciousness, which still doesn't have a, an agreed upon definition even within the sciences. You know, there's the people on on the neuroscience side who say it's all mechanistic and we're kind of robots, meet robots that think we think. And then there are folks on the other side who say, no, there's something more than just the brain going on here. And there's something that may kind of be outside the brain. And in fact, the term that we that some people use in my field and around my field in physics and such for the idea of telepathy and remote viewing is non-local consciousness, that your consciousness can reach out beyond the locality of your just your brain. But we still don't know exactly how this works. And, and unfortunately, there's so little money doing research in parapsychology. We're relying on some people doing consciousness research to kind of at least give us a little hint of what's happening. Well, I thought with telepathy, um, that would have to work in your subconscious level. It, you know, there's, it works in multi, various levels. It typically does work on an unconscious level. Uh, but of course, when you do experiments, you're trying to do conscious connections. 
and it can work in those things. There, there are some good experiments that have been done. The, the problem is that we have an issue in testing. Um, if I'm looking at a, at a picture and you're re- trying to receive the picture, we think that might be telepathy, but it also could be you being doing a little remote viewing, a little right. bit of clairvoyance. You could be picking it up directly from the picture. Forget me. I don't, you don't need me at all. There's just a picture that you're picking up from. Right. And, it, and it even could be precognition where when you, you describe the picture, I then show you the picture and you see how right you were. Well, the very act of me showing you the picture now has created kind of a little loop. So now you've seen the picture in the future. <laughs> your, your guessing, your description is actually based on what you're going to see five minutes later. Right. Well, the reason I ask is I there's people in my life that – I'll just think something and, you know, like my boyfriend, I'll think something and he can be sitting across the room and answer me without me saying anything out loud. Uh, you know, that happens with me and my wife, too. And <laughs> it's it's very common with people who have an emotional connection. And so we, that we do tend to think that that is telepathy, not precognition uh, because of that. But we're still, you know, at... In terms of how much research there is here, the biggest problem we've got in our field, in reality, there are less than a couple hundred researchers today who are doing any sort of research, and not all of them are doing telepathy research. And of those couple hundred, there's probably 10 who have funding to do experiments or work on this kind of this particular issue. Um, the funding is so little in this field. You know, it, it kind of. Frankly, the TV shows bother me in what they've done. They've created a huge community of people who are, who are interested in the paranormal who um, have completely, because of the TV shows, also ignored the field that's been around for over 100 years. And we have people who will spend hundreds of dollars to have an overnight at a supposedly haunted asylum. But if you ask them to join uh, and support an organization – uh, that's doing actual research and we'll provide them back with information too. So it's a kind of not a one way street, it's a two way street. They look at you like you're crazy I and they know. say, you know, why would I support scientific research? I'd rather go in and sit in a, in a dark room in a, in a haunted penitentiary. For me, I, I like the scientific part of it. I mean, I live it. I live so much of this stuff in my personal life and I'm mm-hmm. interested in the scientific facts of it and the scientific side of it. So. And there's, there's actually a lot of information available. Um, I'm on the board of the Ryan Research Center, and I actually teach a couple of online courses through the Ryan Center, one of which is an investigations class. And people can join the Ryan as members, and for their membership, you know, they get access to this huge library of video lectures. Um, the Ryan has had kind of hosted lectures every other week for a few years, and they've been recording them all. And there's this huge library of experts from all sorts of fields talking about these questions and these issues. And people who become members actually get access to this huge bank of information. And it's just surprising to me, even when we show some of the ghost hunters that this stuff is there, they just kind of look at it and say, eh, I'd ra- again, I'd rather go out and sit in the dark someplace. Well, it's interesting. Before- it's interesting being out in the field and experiencing things. Of course it is. But it's, all- it is. it's also interesting to get the the scientific perspective of what it is you're experiencing. Yeah, you know, and what they tend to forget, you can't, you know, the sad thing is that watching a TV show and then following that method and doing investigations is kind of like watching cops and deciding you're going to be a private eye. Right. <laughs> you're, you're not getting the full story. You're not seeing what's really happening. You're not getting any training whatsoever. Um, you know, I, I'm actually, I've met a number of ghost hunters who are very interested in learning this stuff. And I point them to books and I point them to sources and they are in fact learning. Uh, whether they do classes or they do it on their own, they're at least, they're, they're thirst for information and for doing it right, for doing the investigations right and for helping the clients too um, has been really good. But that's not the majority. The majority, you know, really just a lot of them seem to want to be on TV. That seems to be what I hear from a lot of them all the time. But they they say they're doing or they think they're doing science because their heroes on TV claim to be doing scientific research when clearly they're not, uh, not from any scientific perspective. And it's really a shame um, because it only takes reading a couple books to get to kind of up your game hugely, not even minimally, but hugely. That's def- it's definitely true. Um, I listen to a lot of interviews you do um, and 
and it's fascinating to me just the you know when it's happening to you well me personally when it happens to me i don't think about wow there's you know the scientific side of anything i just i just think about holy cow why is this person in here talking to me or what is going on and my my oldest daughter has a lot of the abilities as well Mm -hmm. but she has the abilities with um but a, a lot of the time they're they're little kids and and they're come you know she'll something'll come in a dream or something and it'll be a little kid who gives her her name and that you know she's she died but nobody can find her and when my daughter gets up she'll write it down and she researches it and and she's always found this kid on the the kid she dreams about on these missing you know they're on missing persons dot coms and she finds them and she cannot figure out how to you know it's like she's had this psychic ability as well for her whole life and she can't figure out how to use it or how to you know well use it you know for the good you know that's that's this is a societal problem in fact um i've known several psychics who wanted to volunteer to help find missing kids and a couple have in fact uh, if you want to remind me via email, I'll uh, put you in touch with a friend of mine who's a psychic who has actually volunteered for an organization that at least will take the information and try to use it. Uh, but that's a big problem is that you may get some really as a psychic or having or somebody like your daughter may get some really good information. And then sending that lead in to the police or to a missing persons organization. If you mention that you got it psychically, naturally, what's going to happen is they're going to too many of them will basically dismiss it out of turn and say, yeah, yeah, that, you know. Uh, And the other side of it, of course, from their perspective, is that when somebody is is declared missing or they're doing the kind of search on TV, they get leads from all sorts of people, many of whom are crazy, who claim that they're psychic. Right. So, yeah, you know, it's sifting that stuff out, but a legitimate lead, they should still be presented through some, some means. Whether the police or someone else acts on it, there's nothing you can do about that, but it's something that we we would love to see happen. And there are police who do work with psychics. Um, there have been people who have been open to it. Uh, so it, it, this is something that would be very helpful, I think, for society if at least they would be more open. And a lot of police actually are open to working with people who have these kinds of abilities or have these kind of, of experiences. The problem that they have is as soon as if it gets out that they are doing that, that they're working with psychics, suddenly there's this hue and cry from both the religious side and the debunking, disbelieving side saying that there's a waste of public resources for working with these people. Right. And well, I believe totally that, the, you know, a lot of these people, they're spot on, you know. Yeah, and there's a use for that information. And one of my colleagues who passed away a few years ago, Marcello Truzzi, wrote a book called The Blue Sense a number of years ago. He was a skeptic in terms of, he was a middle of the road skeptic. He didn't know if there was psychic ability or not. He did He did believe, however, there is something to all these experiences that absolutely needed to be researched. And he actually did a study of police and psychics who work with police and found that they were inc- that there were many of them who were incredibly useful. And he said, well, you know, what if they're, forget about them being psychic, what if they somehow unconsciously put two and two together in ways that the police weren't doing? They, they just think differently. They're just wired differently. They kind of do the jigsaw puzzle by looking at the gray side of the, the pieces instead of the picture sides. Right. If that still presents useful information, who cares if they call themselves psychics? All because right. the key is to find those people, is to solve the, the case, is to use that information. If the information is useful, it doesn't matter how the, whether the person thinks that they're psychic and they're not or actually is psychic. Um, I had an experience that I wanted to ask you about. Um, I, my, a friend of mine asked me to come over. Uh, her, her son and daughter-in-law live there with their baby. This is her house, but she lives up the street. She asked me to come over because it was very, there's a lot of things going on. Um, her son, who is always a very loving person, was all of a sudden very angry and violent. And, you know, just the baby was crying all the time and stuff. Well, I how, old was, how old is the son? Um, the son was, at the time, was like 23. Oh, okay. Well, I got in the door. As soon as I walked up to the door, I was fine until I stepped one foot in that house. And both of my feet felt like they were melting through the floor. It mm-hmm. was, I never felt that heavy in my life. 
I mean, I felt like there was literally a ton of weight on the top of my shoulders just pushing me through the floor. I felt like crying. I started sweating. It was horrible. Um, the closer I got to their upstairs, as I got to probably the middle of the staircase going up, I started shaking and I felt really sick to my stomach and I kept saying, there is something, I, I can't be in this house. And I kept telling her, you know, there's somebody in here who does not want me in here. Well, as I got to the top of the steps, you know, I told her it's that room right there. And the closer I got to that room, I mean, I was a mess. Well... When I got in the room, a name came to my mind, and I said the name out loud, and she said, what? And I, I said, you know, he lived here, and he did bad things to little kids. And it was like a, it was like somebody turned on a projector in my brain, and I, it's, I, it wasn't mental pictures like we see with our eyes, but I saw it. Well, when I got home, I looked this information up to the exact address where she lived, and in fact, they couldn't prove it. But they were doing an investigation and they, you know, he was under suspicion that he was kidnapping little kids way back in the day and he was murdering them in that house. Yeah. So how, how long have they been in the house when this all started happening? Um, her son and, and daughter-in-law and baby had just moved in not long before that. But it, she, okay. had, she had lived there a couple years prior to that. And she didn't have too many problems except for like cupboard doors opening and silly things like that. But when when her you know the kids moved in there it just seemed that there was just this you know animosity that he did not want them in that house yeah i mean there there's a couple possibilities one is that he was kind of he was there and was kind of laying low but having the child in there is what triggered the whole thing oh, and that makes you know sense. And if there was an apparition based on what you just said that was probably the most likely trigger was bringing a baby into the place um but there's also this other area which we haven't talked about, which we call haunt, the haunting or residual haunting. And the idea behind that is that places hold both emotion and even real information from time to time. Gettysburg Battlefield is a good example of kind of having a recording of the battle that people have perceived, have picked up on. Um, these are events uh, that are repetitive and buildings can actually kind of hold strong emotion that can be brought out again by a trigger like something connected to the original event, like a, a child coming in. Um, I've been in places um, where the psychics have kind of experienced some real negative stuff and it was all energetic. It was just something really bad had happened in that place. And I've actually personally experienced that myself over the years, that you walk into a place where there'd been um, a murder or something horrendous that had happened there. Uh, and you feel it feels really, really bad. Kind of what you described walking into the place. It was horrible. I yeah. I didn't even know what to do. I didn't want to let her down. But I, as soon as we got up in that room and I said that, I said I have to leave. I'm sorry, but I can't be here because whatever this is is draining everything I got out of me. I have to leave this house and I can't come back here. Well, you know, what it come, there are ways that we've, we've learned to handle those situations. And uh, if there was an entity there, the only way to – there's a couple different ways to deal with that person. But for the place memory, for the recording, um, one of the best things to do is to, to really kind of play really positive music that actually kind of changes the, the feel of that. But there's also this issue of being aware. Did you tell your friend about this guy's – history about I, the history of the place i did immediately i i got on the phone and i said you know what i found out that this guy really was there and this yeah, is that, you know this is what they suspected and she said sue my my kids lives are in danger and i said i don't know any of that but right now i'm telling you there is no actually you know knowing that 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 happened is probably the first step to being able to deal with it so it was good that you told her um you know, their lives were only in danger in that they were in kind of a toxic environment, not because somebody was after them so much. Right. And so we've learned that sometimes really strong magnets can actually change the tone of things. You know, there's a number of different things that can be done to kind of change things. And if there really was a spirit there, there are things you can do for that, too, to kind of deal with a person. Huh. Um, I saw on your site that you have a paranormal TV project that you're doing. Will you explain to our listeners and all those that are interested about that? Well, I put on my site, it's actually not my project. There's a Kickstarter, um, which is going to be finishing pretty soon. I think the guy's uh, time is coming to an end for raising the money. But there, there is a producer 
down in Los Angeles who I've uh, been speaking to, and he's really uh, a good guy. Um, has some other background uh, as a lawyer too, which is which means he's got some edge on some other other aspects of it. But he's been trying to raise money for a TV project. Uh, which is kind of the ultimate EVP experiment, the ultimate experiment in life after death and communication. And what he wants to do is um, document the process of doing this huge experiment, which includes building uh, a room in a haunted place where people have gotten a lot of EVP. And that room would basically be shielded from radio signals and from all the things that people say could also be causing false hits with these spirit voices because there are many other possibilities he wants to bring in uh, electrical engineers and some physicists and some other folks and he, he's hoping to bring in people who have never been connected to the paranormal um, by being able to pay them a decent amount of money that's one of the problems the reality show folks uh, they don't have experts for two reasons one of which is they don't really want experts and the other thing is they don't they're not willing to pay experts anything to spend a couple of days shooting with them and he wants to do that. So he wants to kind of bring in people and attract people who never have been connected to this stuff. And the only way to do that is to actually pay them a decent amount of money. And he'll document that and either sell it to somebody like a network or to Netflix or somebody or or actually just put it up on the web in general. Um, but he had a, a pretty high figure that he had to reach uh, to do this. And I'm kind of hoping that he can still do this. So you can go to my website, which is mindreader.com and scroll down and you'll see see that particular uh, Kickstarter still there. And I think it's still good for a few more days uh, before he has to take it down. You know, with Kickstarter, if you don't raise the money by a certain amount of time, you have to have to start all over again, unfortunately. Well, that was really fascinating for me. I mean, that is like a dream come true for me. Um, I, I, I think it's a great – he's really got a good idea. I would love to see it happen. I would think that everybody who does EVP would want to see this happen uh, because – if, they're, if they still get success in, under the conditions that he's planning on setting up, then you got something real convincing and would probably convince the guys who were not, you know, the idea of bringing in experts who have nothing to do with the paranormal is that if it succeeds under their conditions, you convince them. And that's a big thing. Definitely. That stuff is, so many people are so fascinated with the paranormal, but they just don't understand it. You know, if yeah, it, if it yeah. And, you know, it's always fascinating to me when you know I've talked to a lot of people in the general public and the media, and they always wonder, well, why don't you know more? And, you know, and it boils down to there being a huge prejudice in science and academia. Pe they they think this stuff is all woo woo, and that's the word they even use. Well, I'll tell you, when and, it happens to them, they won't be saying that. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, that's the thing. It's 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 just. I talk, we we talk to people in academia and science who publicly and in front of their colleagues will say this stuff is all crap it's pe people are crazy people are making mistakes they're hallucinating and then they'll pull you aside even in the same like shortly after they just made that statement and say let me tell you about the ghost story what do you think of this they're just all afraid to say anything to their colleagues and with good reason unfortunately i've known people who have lost their jobs uh even at universities unless they were tenured uh, they've lost their jobs at places because they express their interest in the paranormal and they did it in a way and they would even do it in a way that was very scientific you know saying well these are people's experiences we have to figure out what's going on and the very idea that they're interested is enough to, to create problems for them in their job and at the university at the lab that they're working at um, it, it's just ridiculous and it's it reminds me you know that kind of bias is very similar to what happens with the, on the religious side that's, that immediately determines this stuff must be demonic or evil or something like that. It's a it's a snap judgment that's based on fear. It's not based on anything else. Do you think that demons and angels and such like that, do you think that a lot of times, do you think they're separate entities from ghosts and spirits? Uh, we haven't, you know, in, from our perspective, we found, always found other explanations for the what's called demonic stuff going on. So uh, sometimes it's psychic, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's psychological. Um, but we've, we don't, from a scientific perspective, in general, science can't touch things that are of God and even demons are of God. Because basically, you know, if God is everything and all knowing and above, above everything, then truly there's no way for science to study that. 
We can only look at the effects that things happen. Um, but when people report demons or angels, you know, there are very specific religious connotations to those words and or mythological, uh, because in reality, um, angel has different meaning to different religions and to different people. And I grew up uh, in kind of reformed Ju Judaism and uh, demons didn't exist. You know, there's no hell. We don't we don't have hell. We don't have demons. Uh, even though it's the stories are in the Old Testament, those were parables. They were known to us and told to us as uh, lessons, kind of like Aesop's fables. So we were not; those were not considered. Angels, on the other hand, in the Old Testament were considered to be real uh, and actually dangerous. You know, if God sent an angel to your house, you're in big trouble. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> good, chance, good chance you're going to be, be smitten by, you know, somebody's going to smite you with a flaming sword or something like that. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's all considered to be mythology um, and interpretation of other divine or other kinds of activity. From the scientific perspective, we don't include that, and we don't see a lot of evidence of it. And, you know, they may exist. It's just that they don't exist in our reality as far as we're looking at things. So you don't think that when somebody when uh, somebody sent over to investigate a demonic possession, you don't think that they're actually possessed by a demon? No. Well, first, uh, I will tell you, I have gotten calls like that, and many of my colleagues have, and they don't even fit the actual definition of possession. Uh, they might fit what we would call spirit attachment, where there might be a spirit who is kind of hanging around and bothering and kind of even maybe even influencing the person uh, by attaching. But typically the person, if the person is a bully, they get an attachment of a bully. So what's going on, even with the mediums say, the psychics say, is that the attached spirit is very similar, uh, which is why they were attracted to the person to begin with. And it just kind of amps up their bad behavior more than anything else, but it's not true possession. It's easier to deal with. You can deal with it with hypnosis and there are other ways to deal with it as well. Uh, but the true possession cases, uh, you know, in, in the history of parapsychology, there's I think only one case that even made it to parapsychologists because we that we would possibly consider possession. All the others tended to be, um, they're poltergeist cases, things are flying around and obvious, and then people will say, well, the, the kid's possessed. Well, the kid is stressed out which is causing the, the activity, but you can deal with the stress in a very easy way and that stops the activity. Uh, or the kid's just simply a teenager. You know, I can't tell you the number, of, I haven't counted, I've lost count of the number of times that I've gotten calls from parents who say that their teenager, their kid is possessed because of the behavior of the child and the child turns out to be 14, 15 or 16. It's just, you know, one might say that all teenagers are possessed. <laughs> Well, in some ways, they certainly are. Yeah, yeah. So we don't approach it that way, and we do find other explanations. And because of the ghost hunting shows, these t these paranormal shows, we have a real problem. People will be f afraid if they just have one minor thing happen because they're afraid it's going to escalate or they're, they watch these shows and the shows seem to indicate there's some sort of demonic thing going on. And then the ghost hunters are absolutely, a lot of them, uh, this is certainly not all of them, but there are many of them, frankly, who are idiots. I, I'm sorry to say that, but they are. <laughs> they will, you know, they'll walk into a house, they'll get an EVP, and the EVP says, get out. <laughs> now, the, before they got that EVP, they were yelling at the ghost to try to, to you know, you come bother me, you, you they, they start trying to, you know, provoke something. They get to get out. You know, personally, if I owned the house and somebody started yelling at me, get you know, like that, I would say get out. And I probably use stronger language than that. They're actually kind of lucky they haven't gotten worse. <laughs> right. So to me, it's the, the ghost hunters who are acting demonic, not the entity. And we also have people who say they've gotten growls and they assume it's a demon. Well, you know, there can be ghosts of dogs as well. Oh, yeah. And dogs growl and dogs bark. So that doesn't mean it's evil. And there's this incredible um, tendency to be afraid and through fear to put incorrect, to not ask questions that will pierce the veil of what's really going on. And we tend to find that most ghostly activity is either benign, so in a positive way, or mostly neutral. You know, the ghost could care less that you're around most of the time. But there are, you know, there are sometimes bullies, and, and unless you call that bully a demon when they're alive, then I and I wouldn't call them a demon when they're dead. That's true. Um, for people who dabble in the Ouija board department, do you think that that is a dangerous um, 
portal to bring spirits in the wrong way? No more so than provoking ghosts or trying to do EVP and getting communication. The Ouija board works off, actually works off your unconscious mind. Uh, it, it is only a board with letters on it and a pointer. And you can make your own, uh, not have it made by you know the toy company. It, it is not any sort of portal. It is the intention of the people who do it. If anything bad is going to come in, it's because of the intention of the people, not because they're just simply using a Ouija board. However, in the history of looking at the Ouija board, people have found, and it's similar boards like that, that when you're playing it, it does tap into your unconscious mind. And what that means is that if you're trying to, you know, you're playing this game and you're trying to talk to spirits, that something's going to come through unconsciously. You're, you're moving the, uh, the thing around or someone is on the board. Or, in fact, let's face it, a lot of teenagers who use the Ouija board, one, one of the kids is screwing around with the other kids. Right. Trying to scare them. <laughs> I was I did that to my friends. I will fully admit and take responsibility <laughs> for doing that to my friends. And unfortunately, unless you fess up, the other people seem to think that this was really bad. <laughs> well, I've heard some pretty big horror stories about, you know, what the outcome of people who use a Ouija board and what they've brought into their lives. And for me, I don't know if I really believe that. I've used a Ouija board several times. And, oh, yeah. You, you, you know, know, people say you have to have it. I can't even have it in your house. And if that was the case, then every Toys R Us store in the world would be haunted. Very true. <laughs> um, I, You know, it, it, what it boils down to is whatever they did when they were playing the Ouija board psychologically has stuck with them. And it's probably some fear. Something something came, th you know, came out of an unconscious or just their fear. And I talk to people who use the Ouija board have used it. And I said, well, when you played, start playing with it, what was your intention? Well, we're trying to, ca to talk to spirits. And I said, were you afraid you would? <laughs> because most people are actually afraid it's going to be successful. And that is what, you know, fear leads to really weird consequences. And it has nothing to do with outside entities. I think a lot of times our fear brings upon or brings things upon us that we manifest ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I actually had a case years ago where the, the appearance me. of the ghost in front of a man and his wife and his two kids, and they'd seen the ghost before, but it was so sudden one night, the night before we actually did the investigation, that the guy turned, he was so shocked, he turned around and ran into a wall and knocked himself silly. And um, with the ghost apparently being as shocked as the rest of the family, <laughs> according to the wife, and when he woke up, when he fortunately they didn't have the concussion, but when he woke up, he immediately blamed the ghost for throwing him into the wall. And of course, even the kids saw that that didn't happen. Wow. <laughs> That's funny. But Yeah, hum humor is, it's really, there's a lot more humor in these cases than, uh, than other things, I think, than certainly danger we find. You know, ghosts are people too. They're dead, but they're still people. And a lot of them have a good sense of humor. So some of them might be screwing with you. Well, I don't know if I would really too much believe the stories that I hear from people, if I hadn't actually experienced some of these things myself, that's the truth. Right. I, and, and, you know, the thing, thing is that um, people, people do have expectations of activity. They do um, have biases and such. Consequently, I know that they are often sincerely believing their stories, but then we have to figure out what actually caused the experience or what they witnessed. And we do find normal explanations for a lot of it also. And people just have misinterpreted the normal. And when I say normal, I mean explainable things. Uh, they often just misinterpret those things for whatever reason. And that's how actually, you know, I'm trained also as a magician and mentalist. And I perform. Uh, I do entertainment as well. And the one thing you learn in that, uh, learning that sort of work is that people do misinterpret things, which is how magic even works on stage, is that the fact that you count on people misinterpreting things. Right. I think magic is fascinating. I, you sit there and you watch it and you just, there's no way that that's not real. That's all you can think of is there's no right. way that's not really happening. And, and it's because you don't know the, the principles or rules on which the, the effect is actually built. Because those, <laughs> frankly, for a lot of magic tricks, there is no other application in human behavior or, or activity, uh, no practical application for those other things. So it's not the kind of thing that anybody would ever learn unless you want to, we're going to be a magician. Um, and, and consequent, and it's the same. And those kinds of things do happen in reality. They happen in just as a consequence of the normal environment sometimes. So when they do happen, you people misinterpret them based on their 
their actual education, their own personal experience and so on. And that's OK. It's OK to be wrong. Uh, that's our job as parapsychologists when we do investigations is to figure out what part of what they're experiencing might be paranormal, if anything, and what is explainable. So we can actually figure out what that actually what the paranormal thing actually is. Right. Well, um, we're kind of at an hour now. Um, and so I want to wrap things up, but I would really like to thank you so much for coming on our show. This was very fascinating. And I can tell you, I learned a lot from you. Um, the experiences that I've had in my lifetime, uh, make a little bit more sense now from a scientific point of view. <laughs> That's good. Um, before we do wrap things up, can you give our listeners your websites once again so that they can go on and check sure. you out? Sure. My main website is mindreader.com, and you will find my email there in many different places if you want to get in touch with me. Uh, there's a lot of free articles there. There's announcements of the classes that I do. I do distance classes uh, both over the phone and online, so I do diff two different kinds of distance classes. And if people are interested, just get in touch. I'm happy to discuss that. I even occasionally do free teleson teleseminars, free telephone seminars. So uh, make sure you get on my mailing list just by sending me an e email. I'm also on Facebook, uh, although um, my main page, the Lloyd Auerbach page, is topped out at 5,000 friends, so you may have to go to my fan page <laughs> to connect with me there. Um, and I do have a YouTube channel if you just pop my name in. Uh, and just a reminder that uh, the latest book I've got is called ESP Wars East and West. It's by Edwin May, Victor Rubel, and myself, Lloyd Auerbach, and it's about the U.S. and Russian psychic spying programs as used by the military for quite some time. It's actually a pretty cool book, and even if you're just into politics, it's a really cool book. Uh, but it talks about the psychic programs in a lot of different ways for that. Well, that's and then, fascinating, and I'm looking forward to reading your books. Thanks. Thanks. But like I said, this was absolutely fascinating, and I just want to thank you so much. We're, you know, we're new on the scene, but we're so interested in getting the, you know, behind the behind the the storefront of things. You know, we mm -hmm. want to, we really want to get into what's behind the scenes of things, and we want to bring that to our listeners. You know, these so many people are interested, but. They don't, you know, they don't know what's behind the scenes of the things that they're experiencing or hearing about. So, right, right, of course. I just want to thank you so much for for wow. taking your time to be with us. You're very welcome, Sue. And hopefully, we can have you back on again. Sure, happy to chat again. All right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Bye bye. Bye. That was an absolute fascinating, amazing interview. Um, I just want to say I learned a lot today from a very educated man about a field that I am very passionate about. Um, thank you, thank you for being with us. And thank you to our listeners for being with us. Um, that's all we have time for today. We post our shows, and if you want to know more about our guests and upcoming shows, just visit us at info to rail webpage. You just Google info to rail and click on our Google Sites page. Um, I want to thank you all so much for joining us here at Info to Rail, and we hope to see you here each week. May God bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you in these uncertain times. We'll see you soon.